So welcome, welcome everybody, welcome to this circuit service. And, and a special welcome to those who are joining us hopefully and prayerfully on live stream or if you are watching it um, recorded, um, you're still very welcome. We're all together, we're gathered together, we're gathered in the name of Jesus. A warm welcome to John and Miranda. Uh, wonderful that you are here. Great, we've been looking forward to your arrival and here you are. Um, a warm welcome to Tom and Angela, uh, Tom our new community lay worker, and uh, um, our ecumenical guest Beck, of course. Thanks for being with us Beck, it's good to have you with us, Beck a pastor at uh, Hope Whitby. So welcome and welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Kath Charter is going to lead us in our opening responses. We meet together here and in our homes. The hand of God encircles us. God of our beginnings, holiness in love. The feet of Christ walk before us. God of our journey, showing us the way. The wings of the Spirit lift us up. God, who is our company, our energy, our joy. Continue in prayer. Holy God, you call us to be your holy people. To this end, we gather together as your people to worship you, to offer you our praise and thanksgiving. We praise you for the joy of creation, rejoicing that we live in a wonderful part of your kingdom. We praise you for your love shown and experienced through our Lord Jesus Christ and for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. You, our worthy Lord, receive our worship in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Confession. Gracious God, when we do not listen for your word in the words of others, Forgive and forgive us. When we do not use the gifts you have bestowed on us, forgive, forgive and relieve us. When we do not love one another as sisters and brothers in Christ, forgive, forgive and renew us. us. When we do not serve our neighbours in their need, forgive, forgive and renew us. When we do not share the good news with those around us, Forgive and renew us. God calls us to serve, forgives us in Christ, and renews us by the Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. God of all grace, you call your church to be a holy people, to the praise of your name. In the power of your spirit, fill our hearts with your love and our lives with your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We come to the word, two readings, after which our chair of district, who is very welcome among us, it's uh, so comfortable in Leslie's presence, I forgot to welcome him. <laughs> so I've done myself out of that one. <laughs> You are very welcome, and we look forward to you bringing the word. First, we have our readings. Yeah. 
first reading is taken from John 21, verses 15 to 19. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went to wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. And speak to God. Second reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. God, in his mercy, has given us this work to do. And so we are not discouraged. We put aside all secret and shameful deeds. We do not act with deceit, nor do we falsify the word of God. In the full light of truth, we live in God's sight and try to commend ourselves to everyone's good conscience. For if the gospel we preach is hidden, it is hidden only from those who are being lost. They do not believe because their minds have been kept in the dark by the evil God of this world. He keeps them from seeing the light shining on them the light that comes from the good news about the glory of Christ. For he is the exact likeness of God. For it is not ourselves that we preach. We preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. The God who said, out of darkness the light shall shine is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts to bring us the knowledge of God's glory shining in the face of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We pray, come Holy Spirit, come. As we gather here, as we view online, come Holy Spirit, come. And offer your ministry to us, drawing us to Jesus, warming our hearts, directing the footsteps of our future. May your word Speak afresh to our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Well, it's a great joy and privilege to share in this welcome service here, and uh, especially to be welcoming you, John, as Presbyter, and Tom, as Community Lay Worker, with Angela and Miranda. Great to be here, great to join physically with you uh, in this place, and also uh, to those of you joining online. Thank you to everyone who's made this possible. And so a new phase of ministry begins and a new chapter begins 
for the life of this circuit. There's no doubt that these are challenging days to begin a new phase of ministry. The usual opportunities for forming relationships just aren't there or aren't there in the normal way. Even when we can physically meet people, we often struggle to recognize them because of the wretched masks that we're all wearing, and we, we're just struggling, aren't we, to make those linkages in the normal way. And of course, it comes at a time when in so many ways we feel that we're still caught up in the crisis. And, and you don't need me to be spelling out to you all the ways in which these last months have brought for us, in different ways, a challenge and anxiety to us personally, to the church, to the world at large. And although many of us are realizing more clearly as the weeks go by that what we're not being called by God to do is simply try to get back to what we used to do, you are realizing that, aren't you? Um, it's still hard to be clear about what the future will really look like. How on earth will we build back better, as the phrase has it? How can we make sure that we're forging into the future that God really has on his heart for us? It feels like a good moment then to be reminded of verse 1 of this fourth chapter of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, where uh, Paul says, Therefore, since it's by God's mercy that we're engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. If we had more time this afternoon, I'd have suggested that we heard the whole of chapter 4, uh, not least because you see towards the end of the chapter a repetition of that phrase, verse 16. So, we do not lose heart. And Paul, uh, as he writes in verses 7 to 12, just beyond the reading that we had read, he writes plainly of some of the hardships that we can have when we serve Christ that might cause us, that might cause us to lose heart. So he talks of being hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, pressed down. Some of these, it seems to me, are fairly appropriate words for these COVID days. But when Paul is using the words, then he's noting very much the hardships in the context of his own ministry, particularly as he writes here to the Corinthians, who lost a good deal of confidence in him. So how did Paul not lose heart? And how can we ensure that we do not lose heart? I, I hope John uh, and Tom in particular, it doesn't sound too bleak a text to begin a phase of ministry saying we do not lose heart. <laughs> but it seems to me it's an appropriate thing for us all to be considering at this time. Uh, well, the old adage uh, is true, isn't it? If in Paul's writing you see the word therefore, you should always ask yourself what the word is there for. And therefore, at the, uh, therefore, at the beginning of chapter 4, we can read that first one, and we ought to go back to chapter 3. And if I'd have more time this afternoon, we could have heard the whole of chapter 3 as well. That can be your homework, and if you're at home, you can hold it down. But in chapter 3, uh, we read of Paul's reminder uh, that we can keep our heart if, if what, if what, well, it, it's simple and yet it's profound. And it's true, it's simple, but it's true, and it's true, but it's hard for us always to do this. He says we can keep our heart if we continue to focus on seeking the Lord and taking seriously our life in the Spirit. So read verses 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And with uh, ironic humour for these days, and all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Amidst all of our uncertainties, amidst our questions, amidst our wonderings and the hardships that we're facing, it's so important that we do this simple thing profoundly essential as it is for us as followers of Christ, that we focus again and again on him, the author and perfecter of faith, that we're focusing our lives on seeking more of the Spirit, where there's freedom, 
freedom. Sometimes, if I'm honest, I, I don't think we've had half enough freedom in our churches. Uh, and, and what does Paul suggest gets in the way? Well, he talks about these veils. And we need to be on our guard for the veils that get in the way. The veils can be all sorts of things, but just right now there could be a veil that just says, I don't know how the future will unfold. So we panic and it becomes a veil. Or to quote the covenant service, we're faced with situations where not suiting our natural inclinations sounds like a gross understatement. Or when we're worried about how we're going to make things meet, or we're struggling to just see how things are going to keep going. These too easily can be veils that prevent us from focusing on our Lord. Our busyness can become a veil. Our tiredness can become a veil. Our doubts and our uncertainties that can become a veil. Just as for Peter, um, there must have been that huge veil of disappointment in himself as he went to meet Jesus for breakfast on the beach. These COVID months, desperately sad and challenging as they've been for our whole world, they have had some wider, interesting consequences for our church life. For some of us, in amongst all of that, I'm not minimising the hardships for a minute, but in the midst of that, for some, there's been some positives to having normal service suspended. Some have discovered, maybe some of some have discovered an unanticipated, unexpected sense of relief. The rotors have suddenly disappeared. There aren't so many meetings. And I've had quite a lot of conversation with people who've said, do you know, I found some liberty in these lockdown days. Liberty to, to go and worship online in various places and I've really been fed. I've joined in a Bible study, I didn't have time to do a Bible study when I was so busy being a church student, but now I've had time to do some Bible study and get dig deeper. People taking daily prayer more seriously than they have, devoting themselves, as it says in Acts 2, not just waiting for someone else to do it for them. And some folk have said to me, do you know what, I really don't want to go back to that, to the way it was. The veils ironically, that the, the church has somehow managed to create, for some, have been lifted. And people have started to discover what really matters all over again. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Before I was a Methodist minister, I was an accountant. You see how my life has flourished. And one of the jobs that accountants sometimes does is to uh, value a company. And there's various ways to do this, and I'll just spend an hour and a half telling you how to do it now. No, please don't go to sleep. sleep. One of the most obvious ways in which, how are you going to value a company? Well, you work out how much the building it's, it's sitting in is worth, how much stock it's got, how much money it's got in the bank, you add it all up, you take away how much money it owes to other people, and that's the value. Um, well, that's, that's okay, but it really doesn't tell the whole story for most companies. If you think of a business like Mars Incorporated, you know, the, the, the chocolate company, well, they do loads of other things as well, then just to add up the value of the building and the stock and cash and take away average work, that doesn't tell the whole story at all, does it? Because what you've got to think about is all the brands and the values of the band, brands and bounty and galaxy and celebrations and M&Ms and Maltesers and all that business. Um, and so uh, in, in the accountant's world, we talk about tangible assets and intangible assets. And the tangible assets are the things that you can see and touch and add up and see on the bank statement. And the intangible assets are those things that you can't see, but nevertheless, they have great value. And very, very often, it's the, it's the intangible assets that are worth the most. Some of you will remember Gerald Ratner and his jeweler's check. And in about 1991, he made a 10-second bit of a speech and 500 million pounds was knocked off the share value because what he said was, you can pick up a pair of earrings in one of my rapid stores cheaper than you can get a prawn sandwich in Marks and Spencer's and the sandwich is likely to last long. And he thought he was being funny, but, the, but he lost 500 million quid off the share price because 
That's the power of the intangible. The intangible is worth a lot more. And maybe one of the COVID lessons for the church is that we've been too focused on the tangibles and not enough focused on the intangibles. And we've undervalued the intangibles. We spent so much time and energy on buildings and structures and money. That's not to say none of that matters, but what we've not spent enough time valuing highly enough is our life in the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Several months ago, before lockdown, I remember reading uh, an account uh, and a reflection by a, a Russian pastor who lived through Stalin when Christianity was outlawed and the church buildings were confiscated. And his reflection, looking back on that time, was to say this, we were driven to eliminate everything that didn't really matter. But what they were left with, that no regime could take off them, was their relationship with God, their relationship with each other. And God's spirit amongst them. And though in many ways they were captive, they had liberty. They had freedom in their life together. So in the midst of these very strange days, it has been wonderful to see signs of the church and God's people finding some new liberty in the spirit. As I say, people taking fresh responsibility for their own devotional life. New Bible study, even more passionate serving of communities, sharing of faith in many places a deeper pastoral care than had been happening pre-COVID. Despite the distance, distance, because of the phone, yes, the phone has come back in fashion. Letter writing, card writing, pastoral notes, all sorts of things. And all of this gives me hope. And I hope that it will give us all hope here in this circuit as you welcome John and Tom. The challenges remain, of course, the future remains uncertain. Much imagination and improvisation will be needed. And if what we're going to try and do is just get back to the way things were, then we're going to miss the opportunity uh, that we've actually got here. If we focus on a constantly renewing relationship with Christ, that says, echoing Simon Peter, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That's, that's the end. And if we're seeking more of the Spirit, and we're saying, come Holy Spirit, give us that freedom that enables us to be your people. Free, just to be your people. Then I am sure that the therefore that Paul puts at the start of what we have now as chapter 4 will be well placed. Therefore, since it's by God's mercy that we're engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. Because we'll have everything that matters. Jesus, the Spirit. Who cares about anything else? We'll be on fire. This year, the Connection um, has called us. It's an initiative. I'm usually really scared stiff when the Connection does another initiative. Because we get too many, don't we? Anyway, this year, it's a good one. It's a year of prayer. I'll go with that. A year of prayer. A year of prayer asking the Holy Spirit to help us to be a growing, evangelistic, inclusive, justice-seeking church of gospel people. And they're inviting us to use a breakthrough prayer. I thought I would just close with the words of this prayer, that you might just join in your hearts and minds with these words, praying for God to break through afresh into the life of our churches, into our lives, that we might be focusing on our relationship with Jesus, praying, come Holy Spirit, give us freedom. So let us pray. God of love, God for all, your purposes are more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us let go of all that holds us back. Open our lives and our churches to new seasons of humility and faith, of change and growth. Shake us up with the good news of Jesus and show us the way.
are there. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Therefore, we will not lose heart. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, I present to you John, whom the conference has appointed to serve in this circuit. John, will you hold before us the story of God's love and mercy, above all the gospel of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and will you be among us as one who preaches the word of God, administers baptism, presides at the Lord's Supper, teaches the faith, and cares for the flock? I will. And I ask God to help me, and I invite you all to join with me in proclaiming the gospel of life and hope. Through Christ we have good news to share. Will you hold before us God's call to holy living, and be among us as one who awakens the careless and strengthens the faithful? I will. I ask God to help me, and I invite you all to join with me in the way of commitment to the way of Christ. May we reveal Christ's way through our words and examples. Will you hold before us God's commitment to human community, to our neighbourhoods and all who live within them, and to the world that God has made? I will. I ask God to help me, and I invite you all to join with me in sharing God's all-embracing love. May, May we respond to Christ in all we need.
sisters and brothers, will you welcome John and will you offer him your friendship, support and prayers as we join together in the work to which God has called us. With the last hand we go. And so let us pray. God of grace, God of love, thank you for this day. And thank you for John and for Miranda and your call that has brought them here. We give thanks for this new chapter. And uh, Lord, I pray your huge and rich blessing upon John and Miranda as they come and begin ministry here. I pray that you will very soon make them feel that this is exactly where you want them to be, that they'll feel at home uh, because you're uh, at home here with them and you are guiding them. I pray, Lord, that you will bless John and Miranda's ministry in this place, that they'll be able to encourage us and lead us and enable us as your church to share the gospel freely, to see folk come to know the love of Christ for themselves, and to know that love in practical ways, as well as by their own commitment to you. So we pray your huge and rich blessing on John and Miranda, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. Um, one of the things that's been said uh, a number of times today, at other times, is this thing about this being a new chapter. Uh, and that's, that, I think, is really, really appropriate. Uh, because although this is my fourth appointment as a Methodist minister, I was, uh, after coming out of college, I went to Grangewood in Nottingham, and then I went up to uh, inner city Doncaster, and from inner city Doncaster to the leafy Melbourne in South Derbyshire, and now here. And one of the things that's been true is it's, it's, it's not like the BBC. It's not endless repeats. <laughs> you know, you, you don't come somewhere and you're thinking, well, that's what happened there, therefore that's what I'm going to do here, because we're in a different situation, in a different place. And, and one of the great things that I've learned through ministry is, is actually that um, I learn something new every time I go somewhere different. Uh, you know, coming out of, fresh out of college and very green behind the ears, um, you know, I learned so much in that first appointment. And then going on to Doncaster, in inner city, there was so much more that I learned, and very little of what I learned in, in, uh, in sort of the suburbs of, of Nottingham actually fitted in that context. But I learned all sorts of new stuff. And then moving to Melbourne again, a completely different style, style, style of ministry. And so as we begin this new chapter, one of the things that I really do want to say is we begin it together. And we begin moving forward. Of course, I've got some ideas that I've picked up along the way. But actually, I want to work and journey with you and with this circuit. And so that together we can do something that is new and different. Because our God is a God who keeps on moving. We are a pilgrim people, aren't we? You know, early Christians were called followers of the way. I remember uh, years ago, I, uh, when I had a proper job, I was a policeman. And, uh, and one of the things that, uh, uh, that we, we learned when I was in a place was drill. And we would march and square bash and, and round. And actually, if there was a big wall, one of the things that we learned to do was marching on the spot. And I had these really big boots that had hot nails in them. And so they made a really good cracking noise as you mark the time, marching on the spot. And, and if you have looked around here, you know, some of had not been seeing what would happen, you'd think, wow, there's a lot of movement there. Actually, we were going nowhere. way. I, I don't want to be marking time. And one of the things that we were, when we considered, considering where we were going to go, was that we didn't want to go anywhere where it was marking time. And so I want us to journey together. And I want us to go together. And I invite you all to join in that with me. And probably you're going to be dragging me along the way. <laughs> and I hope that that's the truth. That that's true. And so I will continue to pray with you and for you and hope that we journey together.
in God's name. We're hearing about uh, people and what they did. Leslie was an accountant and, uh, wow, well, a policeman, John. Yeah, yeah I, know. No, I didn't know that. And uh, no doubt Tom might mention that he was a teacher. So I used to be a lagger, <laughs> a qualified thermal insulation engineer. That was, uh, that's where I was. Yeah. It's amazing how God gets hold of you where you are, prepares you for ministry. So, uh, right, here we are. Tom. Sisters and brothers, I present to you Tom, who is serving as a community lay worker in this circuit. And the work to which Tom is appointed is particularly concerned with the Barracliffe Estate and the Castle Ward in Scarborough. Tom, we rejoice that you are now exercising this ministry within the life and mission of the church. In your work, you will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that you are called by God to this work in our circuit? I do. Will you accept the discipline of the church and work with us in its mission and ministry? With God's help, I will. Will you be faithful in worship, in prayer, and in reading the Holy Scriptures? With God's help, I will. So let us pray. Gracious God, I do thank you for Tom, I thank you for your call upon his life. And I thank you that that call has led him to this place at this time. I pray that you would gift him with all things necessary to fulfill his calling. And I pray that you would surprise him in his ministry. We pray that his ministry would be fruitful. And we pray that through Tom's ministry, you would reach into the communities. Particularly, we pray, of the Castle Ward and the Barracliffe Estate in Scarborough. And we pray that through his ministry you would touch and change lives. We thank you for Angela and the girls. Paul's, uh, Paul's reminding us that we are your people called to be your people. And as Paul was supported in his ministry, so we pray that Tom would receive that support that he needs. So we pray your blessing upon Tom and we pray that through him many others would be blessed. For we ask these prayers, these blessings in the precious, most wonderful name of Jesus, our living Lord and loving Saviour. Amen. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hello, Mum. <laughs> I won't lie, 2020 is not going to be rocketing up to the top five best ever years of my life. To be honest, it probably will struggle to make the top 35, but there we go. Nevertheless, within that, there are so many blessings in my life. My family, my wife Angela, my children, Ashley, Jessica and Hannah, my mum, my mum. But also this opportunity, this job that's come about. I've been blessed with so much support and so much care in the lead up to this. And I simply ask in return that you continue to pray. I ask you to, to pray for me, but also for the role, for the job, that it will in turn bring blessings to our circuit, to our town in Scarborough, and in particular to the Castle Ward and to the Barracliffe Estate. I thank you for the opportunity to serve, and I will do that with all I can.
Prayer for the staff team. Holy Father, we pray that you hold in your loving hands our staff team as they proclaim the risen Christ and serving the circuit and his communities in their different roles through the challenges of a world beset by uncertainty. Grant we, who they serve, faith, hope and love, that we may support them in their work. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks and praise for the circuit stewards, for Anne, Colin, Peter, Carol, Chris, and Neil. We are thankful for all that they do in the life of our circuit and for their willingness to serve the Methodist people in this area. We pray particularly for Anne as she takes on the responsibilities of senior steward giving thanks as we do so for the work of Michael before her. We ask that others may feel called to join the team of stewards in the future. And in the meantime, we ask that you will equip and bless each one of our present team as they undertake the tasks of circuit stewards in Jesus' name. Amen. So we bring our intercessions, let us pray. Father, hear the prayers we offer, not for ease that prayer shall be, but for strength, that we may ever live our lives courageously. Father, hear the prayers we offer, as we think of the world and everything in it. We bring to you places, people and situations that lie on our hearts and minds. On this sixth day of the month, in our new prayer handbook, we are encouraged to pray for and give thanks for our sisters and brothers in Christ in Southern Africa, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Mozambique, Namibia and South Africa. We give thanks for the women beginning significant roles in leadership within the church. Bless the collective active faith of all your people and the active faith of all seeking peace. We pray for honesty, integrity and wisdom for politicians and those who help bring change to the most vulnerable communities. Father, hear 
the prayers we offer. We think of the staff, pupils and families of the schools, nurseries and colleges across our circuit. We thank you for all the work done in the past six months. We think of the demands of homeschooling and the preparations for a new year and new term. Be with those who are excited, those who are anxious. And we pray that all the educational establishments in our circuit will continue to be places of safety, care and compassion through their foundations of community and family. Father, hear the prayers we offer. We think of one another, of our churches across the circuit, and the place within the communities that each one has. We bring to mind our family, our friends, those we know and love. Be with those who are ill, those separated from loved ones, those feeling lonely, those struggling with grief and loss, those whose faith is weak, those whose faith is strong. We thank you for being our constant companion. Be our strength in hours of weakness, in our wanderings be our guide, through endeavour, failure, danger. Father, be there at our side. Father, hear all the prayers we offer. Amen. Amen. And so I invite you uh, to pray with me the Lord's Prayer to bring our prayers to a close. Our Father, who art Amen. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. One of the joys of being a superintendent minister is that I, I get to do some wonderful things. One of which is, from time to time, to present some certificates, long-serving certificates, to local preachers. And uh, the wonderful thing on this occasion is that actually, um, three of them have virtually been presented. <laughs> Um, and one of them is being presented in person. And uh, the first certificate that's being presented in person is to Kath Charter. And Kath and I go back a long way, don't we, Kath? Not quite 25 years, but we first met in, in Liverpool when I was leading a Share Jesus team. And Kath, young lass that she was in those days, and we were just recalling I was in short trousers. Um, was on my team, weren't you? And uh, yes, Kath, come on down. And uh, <laughs> it gives me great joy to lay on the table <laughs> for you to pick up a certificate that marks 25 years of faithful preaching. Kath, what a joy to present you with that certificate. Thank you. Thank you. We met up again after that, didn't we, Kath? Of all places, we met in the Holy Land. We did, yes. And I remember Kath telling me about the North Yorkshire Coast Circuit. Well, not, not all of it, but a very special part of it called Farlingthorpe. Not knowing that I would uh, even be the minister at Farlingthorpe for six months. There we go. So, <laughs> thank you, Kath. Um, we have three other certificates here. And Diane Robinson, um, Diane, well done, um, and thank you for your 25 years of faithful service. 
And then 60 years ago, something wonderful happened. Uh, my mother went into Middlesbrough General Hospital and came out with me. Um, that's wonderful, isn't it? That was 60 years ago when both John Griffin and Marjorie Dobson were receiving their call to preach and uh, being um, accredited with their call to preach. I'm just putting the thumbs up so the kettle goes on. Um, and there will be coffee and cake for those of us here. So thank you. To, to John and to Marjorie, and uh, you will receive these certificates um, shortly. By the way, did I tell you that Marjorie Dobson's latest book is out and available from all good booksellers? Um, read about it in the circuit newsletter. Um, Marjorie's latest book is available. So I think our four preachers deserve <laughs> One of the highlights of our circuit welcome services has been the cake. Uh, cake from, from all corners of the circuit and in between. Uh, so those of you at home, it's almost time to put the kettle on and uh, raid the cake tin. Uh, for those of us who are here, uh, we will be enjoying tea, coffee and cake um, in the lounge very shortly. Thank you for being here, thank you for joining us and uh, just to remind you that online worship will continue uh, next week for those of you who can't physically make it to church but there are various churches who are holding services. So however and wherever you gather, I pray that you will know God's presence and blessing. So we come to our closing responses. In wonder, we receive the good news. In hope, let us live the good news. In joy, let us share the good news. In the name of Jesus, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.